All right. Well, today we're going to be talking about something pretty practical. We're going to be talking about procurement and how standards fit into that. Our focus will be, of course, open source, obviously. And we're going to try and stick with some of the real challenges and real solutions that might be available for you, your teams, and your company in this space. When it comes to the structure, it's going to be set in context. Then we're going to talk about why one approach is usually better than another, explain when that's not always the case, and of course then we'll end with how to support you in doing the best you can. So our basic structure is to talk about what's going on, explain why it doesn't always work perfectly, but in the majority of cases where it does, here's how you get help. Before starting my talk, I do want to just call out to a few people and projects and communities. I want to call out to Open Invention Network, which to a very large extent helped set strong context for formal actions in managing open source intellectual property. A call out to the SPDX project, which helped set in motion some of the formalization and specification development around management in open source. And I'd also like to give a little call out to my own community, the Open Chain community, which is very strongly represented in Japan, but also globally, as you'll see later. Open Chain itself, which I'll explain briefly, Open Chain is a community supported by its platinum members, 23 companies, chaired as a community by Jimmy Alberg of Ericsson, has worked a great deal in the last eight years in the field of building open standards for open source. Open Chain itself doesn't do anything super complex, but we do something important. We work on the process management side of open source. We're way up at the top of the stack. We make standards below in terms of going into more granular detail. There are standards like SPDX for Software Bill of Materials. And then going more granular, there's implementation approaches, which may or may not use standards, but are about implementing something. In the case of OIN, implementing a patent strategy for open source. In the case of to-do group, implementing OSPOs for management of open source. And of course, in the case of chaos, metrics, implementation of metrics to a certain value. <coughs> open chain, top of stack, process management. We build ISO standards, which are designed to manage open source license compliance open source security assurance. We do the very high level process management. How do you make a program to deal with these things? The ISO standards we build are purposefully quite simple. They cover inbound processes, internal processes, and outbound. They cover inflection points, not process content. In other words, we build the type of approaches that help set the context for how you get open source license compliance and open source security assurance done. Going directly into our topic, the reason we build ISO standards to do something around open source, the reason we have those is because ISO standards, international standards, are a very clear shorthand for something in discussions and negotiations around the world. In our case, they're a clear shorthand for quality, trusted process management approaches to open source license compliance or open source security assurance. There are many ISO standards. For instance, ISO 26262 is clear unambiguous shorthand for functional safety in areas like automotive. OpenChain 
is a project that helps make some baseline standards for how you manage open source. We're not alone. There are others. What we do is a fragment of something that is going to be part of the bigger picture of what we're talking about today. Procurement, managing the supply chain by buying and selling, is really at the heart of a lot of open source, a lot of software, a lot of economics, obviously. Standards are important in procurement to increase efficiency and reduce risk. What we want to do is to try to find some practical ways to use standards in procurement to benefit the different departments in a company, product development, R&D, and so on. We want to basically try to understand and explain in the context of procurement how and why standards matter. Now my focus is to talk about things that a lot of you know about. ISO 5230, that's the open chain standard for open source license compliance. ISO 18974, open chain standard for open source security assurance. ISO 5962, that's the SPDX standard for software bill of materials. I'm going to talk about these fairly typical open source standards and explain how they help in procurement and hopefully equip you to talk with people, either customer procurement departments, supplier procurement departments, and have smoother conversations in transferring open source between companies. Now, there are really two choices in procurement. One is to have custom processes, and the other is to have standardized procurement approaches. Custom processes might include requirements. They might include language. It might include required outcomes that are unique to a company. Standardized procurement practices try to follow an industry approach to requirements, the type of language that you see peers using, and of course, predictable outcomes. In other words, something special and unique, or something that is similar to what everyone else is doing. Now, the challenge to standardizing procurement uh, is real, and it, it comes down to two things, actual business requirements and perceived requirements. When it comes to actual requirements, things like existing production processes or management expectations or regulations in the market are very key. When it comes down to perceived things, maybe you're looking at someone perceiving that they're in a unique company situation, a perception that whatever they're doing is the best because they're the best at what they do, or inertia. We've always done things in X way. Why should we change them to do them in another way, even if the rest of the market is doing that? When we consider actual business requirements, there's some key points to think about. You know, existing production processes do not change without potential consequences. In countries like Japan, companies like Toyota are producing cars at a ferocious pace. Changing a production process around producing cars is a big deal. You have to think very carefully of the consequences if you're producing a car every 24 seconds. Management expectations obviously require significant benefit to be visible. How much money will this save us specifically? How much will it make us specifically? And of course, regulatory requirements simply can't be negotiated. These are fairly hard and fixed lines that have to be overcome. If you want to introduce something like a standard to people who aren't using it, you need to think very carefully about all three of these things. Then the perceived requirements, you know, my company is unique and special. Everyone thinks they're unique and special. 
they're usually overestimating how unique and special they are. The perception of being better than others, again, it's very common. You know, we do things better. That's a bit like everyone thinking they're a superior driver. N not over 50% of people can be the best driver. <laughs> and inertia, you know, changing how we've worked, um, thinking about that carefully, inertia is a challenge, not a strength. Innovation requires change, but inertia is a fact of life. The thing is, I went a little light on this, but perceived requirements came out of something. People put time and energy, they invested perhaps years of their life building things. Even if their perception isn't 100% empirical, it's important to them. To talk about using standards in procurement, we have to have respect. Uh, even if something is a bit silly, like thinking that you're better than everyone and unique. And we have to focus on the super practical because we have to go back into questions of why should we change our production process? How will management see that this is better? Earlier, I showed you this little pyramid and I said, um, you know, open chain is process standards, it fits up here and then there's implementation standards and methods and so on and so forth. I'm going to borrow the image and mix it up a little. If we think about procurement, there's aspects of procurement that are very well known. For example, people know older ISO standards like 9001, 14001, 26262. People are quite familiar with these standards, essentially quality, quality, uh, safety. Now, the open chain standards and the SPDX standards are also ISO standards. So, they're very consistent with the known ISO standards that people are familiar with from other times. In fact, they're totally the same. They're part of the same listings, the same shops, the same font on the ISO website. They fit organically into the idea of other stuff that has aligned around standards. In other words, open source is actually not unique. It's not special. It's just a thing with standards to maintain it. The rationale for using open standards, like the open chain standards or the SPDX standards, is exactly the same fundamental rationale for why people use ISO 9001. Because that's how we align industries. That's how we do things efficiently. There is an alternative, which is this, <laughs> chaos. <laughs> and trying to manage open source in bespoke and strange ways uh, because we think that it's not normal, which is not accurate. Standards are condensing the knowledge that people have built over decades, refining it, and then sharing it with everyone. We've spent 30 years thinking about things like how do you manage open source IP? How do you manage open source security? We've created the process standards for that and shared them freely with everyone. The purpose is a path to efficiency for the supply chain. And that's a message not for people who believe in open source or need to use open source. That's a message for business decision makers. If the company has dependence on open source, then it should probably use the most efficient ways of managing it. To put it another way, why have 12 pages about open source license compliance in a discussion with a supplier, when you can simply say, here's my policy of what's acceptable in licenses or projects to me, and whatever you do in that context, thinking of compliance, use ISO 5230 for processes. And that's it. 
you now know that you're aligned with the best practices for doing exactly what you wanted to do, as opposed to writing a small novel about it. But, and this is where we, we enter the nothing is perfect, uh, the standards don't solve everything, and they're not always appropriate. A production line, as I mentioned earlier, is a delicate thing, and you cannot change things without a risk. There are genuine reasons, real reasons, for organizations not to seek to become more efficient in the future because they perceive a risk in the present. And that's not an emotional argument, it's not an irrational argument, it's a, a genuine argument if people can put numbers and details on it. So context is key. Can we manage open source with standards? Yes. Is it usually the best way? Absolutely. Is it always the best way? Of course not. Nothing is a magical solution for everything. Now, so far, the talk has hinted something which I want to invert. The hint has really been how do we use standards to make ourselves more efficient? And that it also implied that your organization, whoever you are, may adopt a standard and then ask your suppliers to use it. Instead of having the 12 pages of bespoke license compliance language to point at your suppliers and say, use ISO 5230. Implying that this is all in the benefit of the customer as opposed to the supplier. And it's true, but it's only half the story. Standards are to the benefit of suppliers as well. Having customers is obviously a relatively good thing for a business. Having 20 customers asking for different things is challenging. Having 20 customers asking for different things around one thing, like open source license compliance, is just not efficient. If you have to slice and dice your approach to open source license compliance in 20 different ways to make your customers happy, that's a lot of overhead. That's cost for you and ultimately cost for them. The perfect conversation is where on both sides of the procurement discussion, people are aware of the need to align around institutional and market knowledge to reduce the amount of time and reduce the amount of energy they spend getting things done. You know, this one customer says, I'd like this in open source. And the supplier says, yes, of course I can do that. And then the customer says, well, follow my policy and use these ISO standards. And the, and the supplier says, sure, we, we use those standards. Short conversation, quick, aligning with 30 years of knowledge. That's what we'd ideally like to see in the market. We're a long way from that in practice. Some of it is because industries take a long time to evolve. And some of it is because despite 30 years of open source adoption, for most of the companies in most of the world, open source is barely known or understood. It's one lesson that we found in open chain time and time again. The first thousand companies get open source. The next thousand, a little less. After 10 or 15,000 companies, you meet people who are saying, what open source? And it's like, well, the one you just shipped. Now, in open source, broadly, I'm waving my hand here at Linux Foundation and beyond, uh, we thought about how to support the evolution of the market, to explain to people and to support them in finding and using the most efficient ways to deal with open collaborative platforms. And I think we've done quite a good job in designing open communities to help. Another way to put it is we've brought together peers to share with each other. Um, our case study in this talk is Open Chain Project, but the basic ideas that I'll show you are exactly the same for other open communities, like our sister project, SPDX, 
which maintains ISO 5962, or the to-do group, which deals with OSPO management. Those are open communities and have fundamentally the same approaches, access, and support. By the way, Kate is right there from SPDX, so you can grab her later. I can see you even with the spotlights. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, so open communities that can help you. How? If you're involved with OpenChain, you'll know this example, but not everyone in the room is. I will pause dramatically to take a sip of my expensive French water. Yep. Okay. OpenChain built ISO standards, obviously, um, and you can find out lots of details at the QR codes. Like I said at the beginning, process management. We've built the ISO standard for open source license compliance process management, the ISO standard for open source security assurance process management. But we've also done a lot more. We've built peer communities, and that's where companies in the supply chain, customer companies, supplier companies, can get together and share notes and ideas. And I can see it just in this room. I see people from, uh, for example, Sweden and Korea. Uh, and I know they're all in the open chain community. And these are people who get together and share notes and ideas and knowledge to the benefit of all. Our work groups in open chain span the globe and span global topics as well as industry specific verticals. The purpose is to enable people to use the standards and to do other things around making efficient supply chains. Reference material is a huge part of what the open source community has created. Open source developers are notorious for not loving to make documentation, but the good news is, giggles from the audience, <laughs> the good news is that um, when it comes to standards projects like OpenChain, uh, we have enthusiastic document creators. OpenChain has everything from policy templates to reference training slides to checklists and so on and so forth. There's over a thousand documents in our GitHub repo in multiple languages. Not because everyone just does it for fun, but rather because as we align around the standards, as we refine and create roughly common approaches to training or policy development, we reduce errors and increase efficiency once again. And then there's support ecosystems. OpenChain, as it happens, has a very large ecosystem of support. The big picture is we make ISO standards. So everyone who supports ISO standards in the entire world is in a position to support our ISO standards. But very specifically, we've built communities of official partners in areas like tooling, legal, consultancy, and third-party certification to make sure that beyond the community of peers and beyond the reference material, if people want help in any aspect of dealing with open standards that OpenChain makes or dealing with the ramifications of using them, that's available from people who don't just know about the field, but very specifically know about what we're doing and work with us. Right, let's wrap this up with a summary of the key points. First of all, procurement is very contextual. You know, your company requirements depend on a lot of variables. In open chain, we cross every industry vertical, from automotive to consumer electronics to defense. Everyone is different. And you, as an organization, choose your policy and your business relationships. Your supply chain may not be the supply chain that I know or anyone else knows. So procurement is very contextual. And that means, of course, there are differences. But with open platforms, which is the way we mainly use open source, uh, we do mostly the same things. We take a whole bunch of code, we integrate it, we put 5% of unique code on top, and we ship a product. 
That's roughly what we do in broad sweeps. And that means that the fundamental approach to open source tends not to be that different across industry verticals, if you're thinking about management. So if it's not that different, those common approaches become far more viable than it might initially seem. There's a lot less difference than putting open source in a car and an air conditioner and a rocket than it might initially appear. Using standards for procurement is efficient most of the time. That's not a message from the open source community. That's a message from the last almost 200 years of standardization, if we look at the beginning of orgs like Buno Veritas. We know that. It's a proven fact. <laughs> and that's where open source is simply not special. It's not unique. It's just like everything else. So if a procurement department can understand that in exactly the same way as other areas, we've institutionalized decades of refinement in things like intellectual property management or security assurance process management. We've institutionalized that in the context of open source, just like we've institutionalized things like functional safety in automotive. If they can understand that, if they understand the fundamentals of the fact that standards are useful, then the discussion with procurement departments is less onerous than it might seem. I think the key thing is to set that groundwork and get that conversation rolling. Now, OpenChain is happy to help at any time and in any part of that discussion. Uh, as you can imagine, with our global community and just picking randomly, Nokia, not a board member, very active in our community, in fact, hugely active, or Lockheed Martin, currently chairing our spec team. People around the world from very different industries are turning up on calls, building guides, building validators, releasing them for everyone. We, as a community, are happy to help at any time in any part of your evolution as an org, and that includes the procurement challenge, the discussion challenge, the how do I talk to people who don't seem to get it, I need a slide deck challenge. That's what we're here for. QR code will take you to lots of contact details where I'm very happy to simply provide you with as much material as possible. In the context of Open Chain, or in the context of sister projects like SPDX, or in the context of anything you happen to be doing around open source and open standards. In fact, small side note, just the other day I was having a wonderful conversation with a completely different group that were looking at the emergence of open source and open standards and saying, that's interesting, can we do that too? Sure, give us a call. If OpenChain can't answer it, a sister project like Joint Development Foundation focused on standards probably can. Right, I'll wrap up there before it gets boring, but I am happy to take any questions if you do have them. I realize that quite a few people are familiar with open chain, quite a few people are familiar with open source. Not sure how familiar people are in terms of discussing it in the context of procurement. So any questions, just put your hand up and we'll take it. And if there's no questions, we can escape to coffee. All righty. Well, if that's the case, oh, there's a hand up there. Mary, director of open source ecosystem, Volvo Cars. Yeah. Yep. I do have a question about the client. Oh, they're bringing you a, they're bringing you a microphone. Um, the, the triangle chart you yes. examined in the first slide. Do you is, want the open chain one or the, open chain the one. weird spaghetti one? Um, the beginning, in the beginning. OK, the very first one. The very first one. There we are. Yes, I think in the Osmo area, on 
we are quite familiar with uh, open chain SPDX chaos to do, etc. Can you elaborate a little bit about the relation OIN and open chain? What is sure. So, what's the relationship between open invention network and open chain? Uh, friends, <laughs> let me contextualize that. Open invention network started. I think it was 2007, and it focused on essentially patent non-aggression in open source. And at that time period, one of the key challenges to dealing with open source was the risk of patent litigation, or the perceived risk. OIN created a methodology of dramatically reducing the perceived and real risk of patent challenges in open source. So perhaps the greatest accomplishment of OIN was building a patent non-aggression community, which now contains many thousands of companies, pledging they will not use patents aggressively against the Linux system. The Linux system is a term for many thousands of software packages nowadays. So OIN created an industry approach to dealing with open source and patents, an aspect of intellectual property. OIN did not create a formal standard in that domain, but they created a de facto, uh, a usual behavior for how companies would act around open source and patents. OpenChain makes ISO standards, formal international standards. Our most famous one is for license compliance. License compliance is focused mostly on copyright, another aspect of intellectual property. So OpenChain has an ISO standard for dealing with one aspect of intellectual property around open source. Open Invention Network provided a solution for dealing with another aspect. Therefore, we're different, but very complementary. Can I say Open Chain is focused on the license and copyright, and OIN is focused on the patent? Yes, but that would be a broad rather than super accurate statement. We're focused on license compliance process management. Most licenses are mostly focused on copyright. Some licenses do reference patents, so there's a tiny amount of overlap in the fields. But for the purposes of this conversation, yes, broadly that's it. Seems no relationship. Not that much. Oh. <laughs> No, 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 don't say that around lawyers. You'll be there all year. Um, they're both different aspects of intellectual property management. And you're quite right um, that there are different areas where we provide value. But we can say that, for example, OIN helped an industry take a certain direction with patents and open source. They're different to what we do. We build ISO standards, international standards, but we're very complementary. And in, in just the same way, very different chaos does metrics. Um, that has nothing directly to do with what OpenChain does, but it's very complementary that if someone's using process management for compliance and security, that they'll want metrics. So complementary stuff, but those those things there are implementation approaches. Remember, we're way up there, process management. So we all complement each other as a stack of ways to manage things. Um, and rather than thinking that we're doing the same thing, I think the key point is we do slightly different things that fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. And you can use some or all of them to help manage open source and your approach to open source more effectively. Thank you. You're super welcome. Because I try to connect things with a topic, like if I talk about open source contribution project, then compliance is there. 
um, license compliance, security compliance there, chaos is there, open SSF is there, security is there. Then for the patent, I think the license governs the patent as well. So I try to think out, take one open source contribution project as an example, then where is the OIN part? So. Right. I think you're thinking a great deal about the functional side, the implementation side. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and what, what I would do is I'd say that our optic here is that implementation exists and it's very important, but we're looking at the business process management side. So the optic is a little different from implementation. It's about the business strategy approach. So it's, it's, it's just a slightly different optic. Thank you. You're very welcome. All righty. Oh, we have another question. It's Jimmy's friend. Hello, Jimmy's friend. Hello. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. Um, I'm thinking about what are the primary challenges and opportunities for a large-scale comprehensive adoption of the open chain standards? Oh, right. Um, hmm. We've actually had a lot more success than we thought. So for instance, PwC research in Germany, uh, their survey sample indicated that 31% of larger entities had adopted or were planning to adopt ISO 5230. Now that, of course, is contextual to the survey sample they had. So we've had a lot of success, but fundamentally, I think that the challenge is that open source itself is not well in understood in the global supply chain. And communities like this are big, but they're not as big as the supply chain. So education is probably the biggest challenge. And you meet companies which are surprisingly big and still don't understand, for example, that because something is available on a repository on the internet doesn't mean that you can just grab it and do whatever you want with it. So I think education is the biggest challenge. And as soon as people get it, then they start thinking, OK, I need to manage this, just like I need to manage my seat licenses from Microsoft. Um, and then they naturally turn to our standards. Now, most of what I've said about the massive success applies to the first one, 5230. Uh, 18974 for security is a lot newer. Um, so it's one year, less than one year. It's, it's 10 months since we released it as an ISO standard. So it's still very early days. So you know, let's see how that goes. But I can tell you that on Wednesday, we've got a huge announcement about that and adoption. But yeah, education and a certain degree of humility from our community. We know open source is everywhere. It doesn't mean that knowledge of the existence of open source has gone very far, not yet. And Open Chain has been a really good example of that. Instead of dealing with 1,000 companies, we're dealing with tens of thousands of companies. We're dealing with national governments that wander into the domain and ask questions. Uh, things are different at that scale. But things are looking awesome. And for example, I had a lovely conversation with Omar from the UN earlier today, indicating that the industry and things like Open Chain, which came out of industry and community, and global governance, like the UN, are naturally syncing up and will increasingly have chances to work together. So long story short, things are looking good. <laughs> See you on Wednesday then. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now I see that the one minute sign is there. So unless someone has a super pressing, awesome, must be asked question, then I suggest we go and find coffee. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for your time and have a beautiful day.